All right, we're recording. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, this is uh, Bob Hegner, uh, the Finance Committee of the Town Council of Amherst. I am calling to uh, order at uh, 2.03 p.m. by my clock. Um, this is a regular meeting uh, that we've scheduled. Um, the meeting is being held virtually. Uh, for those of you who um, are in the audience, uh, if you have trouble uh, either um, raising your hand or otherwise uh, being recognized for public comment, then please let me know or let Athena know and we can uh, see if we can solve that problem. Uh, there will not be any uh, in-person um, Act, public access at this meeting will just be uh, virtual as we have been for some time now. So uh, before I open up the, the meeting to public comment, I just want to go around the room and make sure that all the committee me members can hear me and can be heard. So uh, if you just can acknowledge that you're here, I'd appreciate it. Um, Andy? I'm here. Bernie? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Councilor Haneke? Present. Tom? Okay, so everyone's here. Uh, we're still short a couple of members. Uh, I wanna welcome Tom Porter to the committee. Um, Tom is a, a longtime Amherst uh, resident. Uh, I guess you grew up here, is that right, Tom? It's true. Yep. 1962. So, so Tom is, uh, uh, he used to be a neighbor of mine, uh, but he moved out and, and he moved back to town. So uh, he couldn't get away from Amherst, but uh, I'm glad he's, uh, he's here. Sorry, I get spam calls all the time. Um, so uh, Tom, welcome. And uh, for those of you who don't know Tom, Tom does come from a, a, a very strong, has a strong, uh, financial background and uh, knows Amherst very well. So uh, I think he'll be a great addition to our team. So with that, um, I'd like to open up the first uh, uh, agenda item is public comment. Um, if you could please uh, raise your hand, uh, those of you who are um, online, if you wish to make a comment, uh, raise your hand. Um, and then uh, we can, uh, pull you in to the meeting. I see two people, three people. Does anyone else want to make, wish to make a public comment? Okay, so that, that's three. Uh, so uh, Anita, why don't you bring in the first person and uh, we'll get started. We'll. Uh, Keep it. Keep your comments to three minutes, please. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can comment on anything that's that's uh, before this committee, as uh, you know, uh, the as a, an object or a, a, a an issue that this committee deals with. It doesn't have to be only on the items that are on the agenda. So, uh, Janet Keller, can you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you live? Sure, my, my name is Janet. Uh, Go ahead, are uh, you muted? Um, <clears throat> my name is Janet Teller. I live um, on Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst. Um, thank you for this opportunity to comment. Please consider the long-term costs of expanding the Jones library um, and compared with competing critical needs to repair and replace other town buildings, roads and infrastructure um, and versus the relatively modest cost of restoring the 1928 and 1993 Jones structure. Um, also the value to Amherst economy of restoring and inst instead of expanding the, this iconic historic landmark um, and replacing the failing 
HVAC system with a cost-effective renewable energy system. And finally, um, replacing slate shingles with slate shingles um, that have a 50 or 100 year life rather than asphalt shingles with a 15 to 30 year life. Um, I uh, thank you for considering these comments. Thank you. Uh, Maria, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you live. Thank you. This is Maria Kopicki. I live in South Amherst. So I am eagerly awaiting your discussion on the financial situation with the proposed Jones demolition and expansion. Uh, the material that was in the packet was pretty skimpy. So I hope that you will be specifically discussing the loss of $1.8 million in historic tax credits, the fact that the $2.1 million in other federal, the HUD and NEH, are very much at risk and uh, are like, like is not to not materialize. Uh, I didn't see anything in there about the proposed value engineering, which was trying to bridge a nearly $7 million gap with $2.9 million in cuts that have been reduced to maybe $1.5 million uh, in value engineering. Um, so I'm interested to see what the Finance Committee, who has a prime responsibility to the town to give advice to the town, how you're gonna to try to square this circle. And I think it's time for this committee and the town council to have some realistic talk about where we are. In addition, the there's $500,000 gonna be spent on continued this engineering, uh, value engineering. And there's probably gonna be a, a million dollars in cost escalation. You've wiped out anything that could possibly be gained by extending this and trying to rebid this. So I'm eager to see what you have to say from a fiscal perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one more person. Arlie, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you live. Hi, uh, I'm Arlie Gould. I live in South Amherst. Um, I'm also uh, concerned about this kind of uh, money that the project just seems to be letting go of, the, the mass historic credits, now the NEH and HUD money at very high risk, just letting go of millions of dollars that could help to pay for this project, um, really because uh, it seems like a unwillingness to deal with the um, historic uh, preservation aspects of the project. That's all what this money is, is tied up around. And they don't want to do that. So this money is just going to, you know, almost $4 million just floating away because, you know, I'm not sure why, but just seem unwilling to do what's necessary to obtain these funds. And, um, yeah, and also, you know, interesting that, you know, half a million dollars plus from their endowment to pay for these value engineering uh, redesigns. Just, um, again, fiscally, you know, what's going on here? It doesn't seem very well managed or planned. It so all seems kind of rushed and ad hoc. And um, there's some question about how the town is paying for the value engineering redesigns. The library is supposed to reimburse. I had some conversation, you know, how fast is that actually happening? It does seem to be happening. Um, so that's a good sign that the town isn't in fact paying for these VEV redesigns. Um, the library is actually maybe doing their share, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you for your comment. Uh, I don't see anyone else uh, who wants to give public comment. Uh, if there is anyone, please raise your hand now. Otherwise, um, we'll just uh, move on to the agenda. Okay, I think that's it. So I'll, I'll close public comment um, and we'll move on to the next item, which is the Jones Library Building Project Financial Update. I just want to make it clear to everyone in the audience that this is just an, an, an update. We're not going to be making decisions today. Uh, we just want to ask some questions and make sure we understand what the finances are. Um, so I don't expect there to be any kind of decision making. Uh, and don't ex I don't want to set an expectation that that's what we're going to accomplish. So, um, uh, Melissa, is, are you prepared to talk about this, the, the kind of current uh, finances that we have? Sure. So um, what I put together, I, um, I got a lot of the information um, from the library itself on, you know, where the funding is coming from and the total um, ap approved cost to date. And then I gathered from that <clears throat> monies that we have spent uh, to date on this project, um, and then um, included the um, the reimbursements that we have received from the library also, just so that people are aware um, those reimbursements are coming fairly quickly um, for the um, value engineering being paid directly from the library itself, in, in essence. Um, I do want to clarify that I reviewed this document um, with um, the library on um, Friday evening and uh, late this morning got some updates that I just want to share with you. Um, I apparently um, in the, the the data in the chart itself is correct, but I um, had omitted um, somehow from the pie calculation the um, Mass Library Board of Commissioners accelerated increase payment of approximately $1.7, which changed is only the percentages in the chart. Um, and I can send that updated chart um, and pie graph to you guys. Um, but essentially is 34% uh, town share, 34% library commission, 2% CPA, and 30% trustee commitments, 15 of which um, still needs to be raised by the um, by the trustees. Um, and they just wanted to clarify that um, their responsibility for that. Um, and uh, to go through it briefly, uh, the town has committed, you know, $15 million um, to this project. Um, the CPA is um, committed a million. The um, Library Board of Commissioners, um, that amount is um, 15 15 million 500,000 more or less, um, leaving the balance of the commitment um, on the currently approved project amount of 46 million um, of 13.8 million to be raised by the library commissioners. Um, and the, this is their um, funding grants that they've received to date and their um, community campaign um, amounts. Um, totaling uh, just over $7 million um, with approximately um, $6.8 million left to be raised. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Anyone on the committee? Uh, I, I, I do want to talk about the uh, additional federal and state grants. Um, that are on the, uh, it's not on, it's in, I guess this is the, the second page of your, of your report. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that these grants have been, the library is basically in the process of redoing their paperwork to get these grants. They won't get them until we actually start construction. Um, these are not grants that are proactively given it, you know, before the project begins. So we won't, you know, we, we, we won't see that money until we actually start the project itself. Um, is that correct? 
Is right. The, those numbers were given to me from the library. Um, I don't have any um, record of those commitments. That's just what they have on their funding sheet. And I was just re-reporting it. Um, I don't have access to their campaign. They consider this part of their campaign. Yeah, it's, it is it is part of their campaign, but it's what I'm, in response to public comments, I just wanna point out that, that we can't, we won't see that money until we actually uh, start the construction. Um, but my understanding is that um, it's, it's, these are not necessarily at risk just because we didn't get the historic tax credits. We can still get these, these sources of money. Um, we can still get these grants. So um, it's just a matter of working through, you know, working through the process that we need to go through. Uh, Bernie, did you have a question? Bernie, you're you're on mute. Muted? Uh, yeah. Um, when you say we won't see the money, it's not that we won't know that we have the grants. <laughs> They'll right. be awarded. Right. Uh, they're they're going to be negotiating these grants out uh, over the course of the uh, of next month or so. So, um, I mean, we'll we'll know if the money's there or not. And um, you know, these shouldn't be considered at risk because they're not at this point, they can still get them. Um, and in fact, the Mass Library Board of uh, the Historical Commission could even, or historical, state historical could even change their minds if they choose. Um, and that, when we'll get into the politics behind. I, and the, the comment I wanna make about the his, historicity is uh, this building was built by people who didn't operate under the same sets of constraints we do. Uh, and one wonders what it would look like if they tried to build it now. Uh, and we're sort of finding that out. Um, so I, um, I understand that the building is old, the building is uh, architecturally interesting. Uh, it's, it, uh, it, it's a, has some value to people, but understand that it was built um, on a whim. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> there, there was no zoning, there was no you know, uh, controls. So let's uh, let's take some of the con concerns about historicity with a grain of salt. And speaking as someone who's trained as a historian, thanks. Kathy? Uh, yeah, Melissa, I'm not sure you can answer this, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, the two federal grants, the NEH grant and the HUD grant, both require a section 106 review, which um, deals with historic. And I believe from what actually we've read in the newspaper, but also we got a brief report, there's been a consultant added to the town or the trustees to help us with that process. So my question, that, that review could put those grants at risk. And one of the uh, advisements on the federal side is make sure you go through that review before you sign a contract for the building. You know, because you before you you kind of read it like before you go out to bid, because if there's something you could change, you might not put it at risk. So do you know whether the timing, whether the 106 review will com be completely done before we go out to bid or uh uh, you know, so it's a timing of that review so that well, we, we will know. And, and Bernie, I'm not dealing necessarily with in love with this piece or that piece of the library, but it's a couple million dollars more that that would be on the to be raised side. And it starts to be more than the trustees endowment at that point, you know, and that's one of their collaterals. So that's that's the question I'm just wondering when we will know whether we have in fact secured those, whether we get them on day one or not, I understand they'll might be payout over a year. Um, so it's the timing on that review and whether we know it's a green light, an so, orange light or any variation on that. So Kathy, I, I don't 
I don't know. Um, I've yeah. heard the same things that you've heard that there's this application that needs to, to this review that needs to be done, but I have not been involved in that process, nor do I know um, when we will know the answer on, on that. Um, I can ask, so, I can ask the library trustees and the fundraisers, you know, if they can help me and I can get back to you, but I, I just don't know. Well, we could also, we have a council meeting next Monday night, so we could also say we'd like to at least know the timing of that, make sure the town manager or someone there can speak to it, because I, I realize it's, there's a team involved in all of this that's following mm -hmm. it really closely. Um, so my question is on timing. And okay. whether we will. Okay. I'll, Thanks. I'll, I'll do my best to get an answer for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the committee? No, not here. Oh, Andy? Yes, I'll just ask one question as to whether there has been any further review of the uh, repair option that we would have to go to if we can't complete the project as the trustees have recommended. Uh, the uh, Coon Riddle uh, was uh, a fairly thorough analysis of the work that was known to be done at that time, we know that there's some additional work that has to happen because of changes in codes and requirements since then. Uh, but uh, I think it's always um, worth knowing when we're considering this, what, what uh, the alternative cost is. Um, so I was curious whether there's been any thought given to that side. Is is that a question for me? <laughs> if you know anything, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I don't know because I think what they're um, going forward with is to, um, to move forward with if they can do a redesign um, before investing additional monies in, you know, what would what costs would be to um, do repairs at this point? Because then, of course, Coon Riddle would have to, you know, we'd have to pay that. My assumption is that we would have to pay them for that as well. So I think they're just doing one step at a time in hopes. Um, but I, but I honestly don't know, and I haven't gotten um, a report. I don't think that we've gotten a report back from um, Coon Riddle as to if a redesign can be done. Um, but they, they were doing several. Um, they did the last meeting that I attended for the library. They were, you know, they gotten some feedback and we're going to try and do some, some changes to the redesign. So that report hasn't been completed yet. So we don't know where that is yet. They're still in the, um, they're still designing the project, you know, if they can do a redesign. And I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure if they're including a renovation within that, or if that's, um, after they do this redesign. I, I don't know. Bernie? Yeah, um, two points of clarification. I just felt parenthetical remark it would re be really helpful if we had somebody from the library, um, either the trustees or uh, the head of the program here um, to further this discussion. Two things, one, it's dangerous to assume that any kind of renovation will be cheaper uh, because we're going to renovate. Uh, there'll, there'll be no state money. Uh, and there'll be a series, and they're likely to, if, especially if the renovations are done in a series where you have repeated uh, mobilizations and different contractors coming in and out, it'll be a prolonged process and it will be expensive. The library is loaded with asbestos. In some cases, it would be just easier to take things out and take them away than to try and work uh, and abate the asbestos. Um, th those are those are things that you're going to have to look at for one and for two. Just to remind people that the trustees are independently elected officers. They have control <laughs> over the the library's endowment, and so how they they choose to spend that endowment 
is a matter between them and their constituents. Um, you know, it's a problem when you have, you know, elected bodies. Uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they've been elected by the same people that have elected the council, elected the school committee. Thanks. Thanks. Any other uh, questions or comments? Tom? Thank you, Bob. And uh, thank you, Melissa. I, I'm new here, as you know. So um, I, I know this is a, a an interim update. I'm just curious at how often you hear from uh, the library and what would be the next milestone for an update. Um, well, I just, while we were in this meeting, got a um, a meeting scheduled for September 17th. So that would be my next time that I would know anything more from the library. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments on this? It, you know, I, I, I recognize that, that we, we don't have anyone from the library present. Um, I did, I was expecting there to be someone here. So um, that's too bad. Um, it, it's hard to ask Melissa to <laughs> all these questions because she's, I'm sure she's drinking from a fire hose as, as we speak. <laughs> so, um, and this is a very, very controversial uh, project. So I, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, unfortunate that we can't really look at a, a lot of this information in detail. Um, but as I, as, as Bernie pointed out, this is, um, you know, the, the library trustees are, are, are an elected body and uh, we can, they, they do have the responsibility here to uh, oversee the library. And so um, we, there's the, 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 the town council has, um, you know, the appropriation authority, but we don't really have the authority to go in and, and micromanage a project like this. So just bear that in mind, everyone. Um, any other comments before I wrap up this? Bob, just one, I just wanna follow up on what you said. The council does need to be financially accountable to the taxpayers. So one of my questions is if it doesn't appear that during the life of this project, if we can stay within the 46 million, that's the first big question and we won't know that till the bids come in. But if the 46 million has a bigger fundraising gap because the funds haven't come in, the town is the one who's gonna be at risk. So even though yes, Bernie, we're all elected, um, at the point at the point, the level is beyond what the library can cough up. No, but none of them can put their mortgages mortgages on their home. I mean, we 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 will be paying that. So, so these questions are mainly just to, trying to get a status point. You know, where you know the we knew it was seven million when we looked at it at the end of last year, and there was still the hope for historic tax credits that would close that seven by two, but those are gone. So the question about these other two federal grants is a real one. So any information we can get out of the trustees, both on where their trust their fundraising is going, but also how uh, how we're going to fare in this kind of when you read the federal regs on section one hundred six, it is they go on for pages on what what's going to be looked at, who's going to look at it and who's responsible. So just some sense on the timing on that, I think would be really helpful because we voted we voted the 46 million. And so we need to know how much we're gonna be on the hook for. Uh, and I think so that, I, yeah, can't speak, I can't speak for the trustees. I can only speak for certain conversations I've had. And I think people um, on the library trustees, I think fully are fully aware that there's a limit yeah. Uh, both to what they can spend, what the town's willing to spend. That line has been drawn. You know, the town's made its commitments, financial commitments. They understand what the limits are. And I think they would admit if the prices are out of control, the project is mute, moot. And, I, you, you know, we just need to let this roll forward. Uh, I've never seen a brief federal regulation, including the regulation that talks about paperwork reduction. 
So uh, <laughs> that's why you hire consultants to deal with that. I managed to avoid right. much of that in my career, uh, thankfully. So yeah, I, I mean, people understand there's limits. And and let's not, you know, go, there, there's, I, I guess, Kathy, I'm excluding you from this, but there's been a lot of awfulizing about this project by certain parties and that continues. And I think we just need to set it aside and take a nice, calm look at this and understand what the process is and understand where the money is coming from. And as far as I know, no one on the trustees have just fallen off the turnip truck or out of the coconut tree or wherever you come from. They understand that there are limits. And, and we've pretty much outlined them around the page for 47 million. So let's let's move forward with this and uh, and and uh, let, let's back off on some of the awfulizing around this until we have a uh, real reason to do so. Okay. Any other anyone else? Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is an an Ray. I appreciate you being here, uh, and this is. Just again, a gut, an update, a financial update on the Cherry Hill Golf Course, just to kind of, you know, how are we doing? Do we make money? Do we lose money on the golf course? And how much do we make or how much do we lose? Um, so uh, I don't know if, Ray, if you want to brief us. Uh, I mean, I've seen what you've sent. Yeah, and I just want to say they came in late this afternoon. Well, my time, it's the middle of the night. But anyway, um, I'm in Switzerland, oh. but I did get a chance to look at them. So it would be good if we could also see them on the screen at some point, Bob. Yeah. Okay. Oh. You wanna... Athena, can you put these on the screen? Yep, I'll grab that now. You wanna see the spreadsheet? Uh, I think the spreadsheet is probably the most um, there's one that shows expenses and revenues. Uh, so there's number one and number two. And uh, number one, it has the revenue. Because the revenues are the part we haven't seen in the budget books. I mean, it's how they know because I asked her about the fees. That's that's a piece that's... So in any case, that was... Yes, okay. Um, I can... I think I can be brief here. This is coming up on the screen now. Um, we are, uh, Cherry Hill is making money right now. Uh, revenue is coming in uh, in advance of those of of those expenses. I believe that we are, uh, you know, trying, given our limitations, of trying to limit the amount of of uh, revenue that we lose. We when I took over Cherry Hill three years ago, there were leaks that we were trying to fill. Uh, in terms of uh, clubhouse revenue, um, we are trying to uh, uh, maintain the momentum of of the pandemic when numbers were very, very high for us for usage. And I, I think we've successfully it certainly went back down after the pandemic and people went back to work. but we were able to not not lose that much over the course of the last few years in terms of in terms of uh, active play. The uh, uh, we've been trying to be creative about using the space in off season. Uh, weather hasn't been great for the winter time for us to do snow activities up there, but we've been trying to use that space in a way that makes sense. But in uh, all in all, I think the the trend here is that our revenues have been that have exceeded the expenses. Uh, the, the the panic that I get into as a manager, as a director of the recreation department charged with the Cherry Hill budget is that the, uh, you know, we're at times we feel like we're spending more than we're supposed to be spending. And that's, that's what has us yearly trying to be creative about ways to make the money that we're making and make more of it. But at the same time, uh, uh, come under the budget restrictions that I think are necessarily put on us. And so, uh, you know, in the last four years, uh, the the, the uh, our uh, we have we have now consistently been been making more money than we've been spending, which is our ultimate goal. Okay. 
Yeah, I noticed, um, Ray, that if you if you add in the um, the capital expenditures, which um, come from the separate budget, but they're still a part of the town uh, expenses and the fringe, which also is covered under a different part of the budget, then uh, it doesn't look like you're making money. You're actually losing a little bit um, in the last actually you made money in 2021 even with with that uh factoring that in in 2022 you lost about 17,000 in 2023 about 58,000 in 2024 about 37,000 i mean it's not it's not paper losses in the in the sense that it's it's just kind of looking at at total cost if you will um you know, I think I think it's you've you've managed the budget very well. Uh, this is a part of the budget that, you know, you don't see, <laughs> uh, so to speak. Um, so um, it's it's hard to manage with that in mind, and and other departments don't manage that way. Uh, but I think in terms of total cost, we you know we need to we need to think whether, you know, it it there's other things we can do to increase the revenues, um, you know, beyond, you know, kind of operating a golf course. Um, and so, and I know you're, you're thinking about that. Um, but I think that, uh, we're not, you know, it, in my mind, we're sort of, we're kind of barely breaking even if you will, uh, right now. Um, and, uh, I don't mind if we lose, you know, 10,000, 20,000, uh, a year, that's, that's the cost of doing business, so to speak. Um, and it's, so it's, it's really only, you know, one, one year that that it's been sort of out of whack. So that's pretty good. Even when, when you consider the fringe benefits and the, the, uh, the uh, capital improvements, um, capital expenditures. So I think, I think you, you're, it's managed pretty well. Uh, I think we just need to, you know, everyone needs to think about other things we can do there so that um, we get those revenues uh, higher if we can. So anyway, uh, that's what my take is. Uh, Council Haneke? Um, I, I had a similar take to uh, Bob when I did the uh, capital and estimated fringe on top, what looked like, you know, a break even or an enterprise that might be able to subsidize other recreation departments uh, suddenly becomes one that is not. And I will say before 2020, those numbers were a lot worse <laughs> with capital and, and all of that. And so I, I am happy to see and, and that since COVID and that big rise in 2021, that you've been able to sort of keep those numbers, those revenues as high that that bump we saw has sort of become a multi-year bump, hopefully more permanent. Um, but that the, the question it leads me to um, is one that is not um, something that people like to ask, which is, should we as a municipality be running a golf course? Um, and so I'd like to hear your take on a recreation department, a municipality, what what types of recreational facilities should a municipality bring in or do under its purview versus allow the private market to do? Um, what other uses would this land have if we were to say, you know, that that sixty thousand dollars that represents a loss when you get rid of when when you think about fringe and capital on top of it. If we can't start kind of breaking even, that sixty thousand can go somewhere else. That's even within recreation potentially, right? That maybe you'd have sixty thousand more to to do something else with recreation. And so, can you speak to that? Hopefully, I made myself clear. I think you did. Thank you. Um, and first of all, thank you uh, again for noticing that it takes a little bit of work on our part to keep that to keep those trends up. Uh, I've got a staff that's been very conscious about it, been very conscious about 
the numbers that come through there. So I do appreciate your acknowledging that piece of it. Um, I think I can answer that in two different ways. Uh, one is that when I took it over, I spoke to the town manager about some of the challenges that I didn't know when I took the job were attached to the job. Um, and and Cherry Hill's budget was one of those things that sort of I, I was inspired by the opportunity to try and challenge. Um, the, uh, the way I see it is that Cherry Hill is a gorgeous resource. It's a gorgeous asset that the town has. And for whatever reason, when the town made the purchase, whenever, uh, when they brought, the, when they brought Cherry Hill into the fold, my, my interest as the director now is to, is to, uh, you know, allow that asset to grow as much as I can and to make money off of it. Uh, uh, I don't make the decisions about what happens next with it. I think it is, it has been a headache for my staff and I in terms of how to do this responsibly, how to do this in a way that, that, uh, uh, you know, you know, answers are, are that, that allows us to answer the, the needs of the taxpayers to, uh, to provide quality recreation to the people who go out there and use it. Um, my, my thing from the very beginning is, it's it's under our umbrella. We're going to find a way to make the most out of it as we can. If it's if it if somebody was to come and tell us that it's not operable, as much as I love the 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 uh, uh, the I, I love running a golf course. It's a it's a really cool part of of the job that I've taken on. Um, if the town told me that it wasn't in our best interest financially in terms of business sake, then I could make a pivot away from it, but uh, as long as we have that asset, as long as that's underneath recreation, we are going to continue. We've already have, I think we have some, you know, the next phase of trying to trying to build more revenue out of there to offset some of the costs. I think we're in the process of trying to put another idea on the table. It might be very, very uh, strong for us, but as long as we own that asset, uh, I and my staff intend to make the most out of it as we possibly can for the people of Amherst, for the golfers of Cherry Hill, and all the people who use that space. Um, uh, uh, and but then the second way that I would answer that question is that uh, you know, why are we in the business of doing golf other than the fact that we have it and it's better to do something with it than to do nothing? Um, why are we in the business of doing golf? I think that. Uh, uh, you know, there's, I, I've, I came in at the late end of the conversation. I've only been in this conversation for a small number of years as it's been going on long since before I got in. Um, uh, I think golf is more than, I think the, there's the one thing that I would like to make sure that it's clear for the fans community and everybody else is that it's not, no, Cherry Hill is not a course that operates for the town elites. It's not a place that 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 uh, you know uh, big money comes in to sort of do big money stuff. I think part of when we think of golf, we think of golf as being sort of one of those those specialty elite sort of activities. Uh, we saw during the pandemic just how important it can be for recreational activity. I think it's a I think it's a really really it's a different way of doing recreation than a lot of our other programming. I think it's a. I think it's an engaging way to to meet members of our community. If you go out there and run through the parking lot, you will see, you will see uh, a, sort of a, a really interesting cross section of all a bunch of people who don't do other things with the town. It is a relationship with the colleges. Uh, one of the ways that we've raised uh, revenue here is in by addressing college memberships and trying to build in co membership packages that allow more and more college students to use the space. As many challenges as that may bring us also. We're using more college students in, in North Amherst where that, uh, where the, uh, you know, the, the demographics of North Amherst have been changing uh, as as they expand and get more and more college kids in. We've been uh, we've been basically reaching out and and connecting in with that college community in ways that I'm sure that Cherry Hill has done that before. But we're trying to meet the changing times with 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 a, in a way that speaks to to Amherst needs and Amherst interests. Um, 
uh, it is, of course, it's health and recreation. It's, it's, it, it is a way to get out if, if people are golfers, you know that it's not just going out there and, and uh, you know, passively, uh, you know, doing something. It, it, is, it is a way for people to continue to stay active. It's a way for people to continue to stay healthy long into, long beyond the time where we start retiring from other sports that we play. And I think that's a, I think that's a really, really positive thing about why we, it, it has such a, a strong value. And, and lastly, I think, uh, you know, it's not the same thing. I know it's not the same thing, but we do heavily subsidize things like aquatics, which we're very, very fortunate for. I think it fits a mission. I think that golf also fits a mission. It's a different mission, but I think golf also fits an important mission that we have as a town have of, of, of reaching out to people who can use this space, who can use, who can use this for active recreation. Um, we, we subsidize things like swimming in a way that I think makes us better. And nobody questions that. Nobody asks about that. I don't want to say nobody. We do have to, we do have to answer that question, but uh, we, we're, we're, uh, you know, we know that because it speaks to a group of people, kids and families, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, at least to some significant degree is a, it's a life skill. It's a, it's a life preservation skill. These are, these are reasons why the pool doesn't get the same sort of stress and pressure. Uh, but we know that we know that we also do, we are in the business of providing golf and providing this leisurely activity, providing this, providing leagues, providing an access to the asset that the town has in a way that I think makes Amherst, strong um and so i'm not I, I i will defend it because it's mine i will defend it because it's something that we that we operate that i think we're doing a decent job of and we can continue to do a decent job of that uh i know that it, it's a it's a stressor for for me at the end of the fiscal year every year because of where we should be and where we're where we're going it's a stressor for me because we've reduced staff as a part of uh, we, you know it, we've we've made cuts there to try and protect our revenue we've made cuts there which put a lot of strain on the people who work there on the groundskeeper on the uh, on our on our ground staff and on our on our uh, uh, clubhouse staff We've, we're putting more and more strain on the people who operate and have to live in that world, uh, and so and so as much stress as it gives us, we think that we're doing we're 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 bringing in money, we're doing the best of our service that we possibly can, and so uh, you know I defend it because it's ours, but I also defend it because I think it fits a mission that 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 we can all get behind. How did I do? Kathy? Um, I just want to speak to that, Ray, because I agree. And Mandy, if one thing you should realize is CPA money helped buy this. So it's going to be safe. It's not like there's an alternative use, like a big apartment building. The other thing about the land is it's really wet. Um, and uh, at certain times of the year, uh, whether you're walking it or golfing it, you want to wear your, your high boots. Um, uh, because the, you sink into it. But it is used by people who walk. It's not just used by golfers. All year round, there are people out there playing with kids, playing with their dogs. So when the golf course closes, they have to actually protect the tees. Okay, you can talk to this because the greens, they have to, because it's getting so much foot traffic. And when we're lucky enough to have snow, it's amazing amount of cross country skiers and sledders who go out there. So this, this, we don't have anything quite like it. And I can imagine if we didn't have golf, we would have this really tall grass and we'd have puddles of water everywhere. <laughs> so it's, it is a big resource. So I was one of the ones who asked for this review because when I was looking at the end of the year quarterly reports, we're making money until we add back capital and fringes and the other thing people should know about capital is because other golf courses are going under, Ray's been able to find used equipment. So we're, we're, getting, we're getting things really cheaply like greens mowers. Um, and so the, the staff who are doing a terrific job. So I just want to speak to it as a 
a resource that I've watched the apartment buildings up in the north side of town advertise the fact that they've got Mill River and a golf course as a why you should want to live up here um, um, with families with kids and little kids are out there. So it's a resource. So I didn't see the numbers, Bob, you just cited on capital and fringes because there's not a lot of full-time staff. So I was, I know it's not in the regular revenue and expenses, but I wasn't sure quite where that calculation that turned, you know, 30, 30,000 plus or 60,000 plus into a negative, but we're right on the fringe of being near to break even if you don't, if you don't do capital expenses at all. You know, if you just do the maintenance costs. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the so that's, spending... that's all I want to say. I think it's an, a pretty amazing resource that the, uh, the management of it, the expense line has not just stayed down, but it's lower than it used to be. You know, there's a real bit of management of our expense because there's volunteers who come out. There's a huge number of people who come out on cleanup day to clean up twigs and leaves. Um, so it is a valued resource. Yeah, so uh, it, it, Athena sent around a second spreadsheet that had the fringe numbers in it. Maybe you just- Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't see that one, yeah. Okay. You should have it. Okay. Andy? Yeah, uh, I guess a couple things. One is uh, the question of capital is a hard one for any budget and this one is all we're speaking about because it's not something that happens that you make all of the purchases on an annual basis you're talking about equipment where you might buy one piece of equipment that is a number of years so that it's not an even number that works across all all budget years because of that fact um I think that the second thing that I just want to note, uh, Kathy, you had mentioned uh, that it was required with CPA money. I don't think that's correct because I don't think we had CPA money back at the time that it was required. But I, it, uh, Dave may get to this question or be able to answer it. Um, my recollection, because I was a member of town meeting still when, the, when we made that acquisition, uh, was that there was a uh, grant that was a state grant that had to do with uh, buying for recreational purposes and um, that there is a restriction on the use of the land that it has to be used for recreational purposes, uh, which um, the... the and I assume that that's um, an obligation that continues with the land. Um, the uh, That opens up another question that I had is whether there are other recreational um, uses that we can make of that land. And I thought about it having to do with the forever um, challenge to find a location for pickleball <laughs> as to whether... Uh, that's something that should be considered if the Stanley um, Street, uh, uh, the Qantas Park doesn't work out as a location and we had set aside CPA money, whether uh, because there is recreation land and parking facilities and whether that's a possibility that anybody has given any consideration to and um, the last thing that I'll just, uh, since I'm covering tons of topics, I did did seem that uh, the projected 25 budget looked a little worse than prior years as far as the uh, balance between revenue and expenses. And but, uh, whether that is anything that we can make any state as a concern at this point, because obviously um, it's a year in progress. And so it's based on projections, not reality. So those are what my comments are and I'll turn it back. Okay, uh, Dave. <clears throat> uh, thank, can everybody hear me? Yeah. 
Thank you, Bob. I, I don't know how deep a dive you want to go on this today. I know it was supposed to be a little bit shallower, but um, you know, I, I think we're all happy to come back at a future date if we wanted to do a deeper dive. I think this has been a good conversation, lots of good points made. Um, just to answer Andy's question, um, I don't have it right off the top of my head, but um, I believe it was either a self-help grant or Land and Water Conservation Fund grant that uh, paid for the bulk of the purchase of um, of Cherry Hill some years ago. And uh, Andy was correct. I mean, there's there's no requirement to run a, a municipal golf course there or a golf course of any kind uh, long term. It's just the land is permanently protected. Um, I, I, I won't go into great detail, but suffice it to say that, you know, finance and Ray and I and Paul have had many conversations about Hickory through the, whoops, sorry, Hickory, Cherry Hill uh, through the years. Um, and I think, you know, to Mandy's question, you know, uh, should we be in the golf business? I think that's kind of a fundamental question that that we need to continue to look at, you know, year in, year out. Um, Paul has charged Ray and myself and others with with um, looking a little deeper at that question and looking at uh, pulling together a group. I believe Ray has mentioned this at his uh, recreation uh, commission meetings, but pulling together a group to really look at, at everything, you know, top to bottom at, um, at Cherry Hill, the finances, uh, opportunities for alternative revenue stream, uh, long-term capital needs, um, you know, what is our commitment long-term to running a golf course there? I know that in many conversations and even here today, Ray has talked about the reduced budget at Cherry Hill and the demands on staff and the pressure on staff. And I think that's a real fundamental question for me. Is Cherry Hill sustainable both financially and from a staff standpoint over the next five or more years? Um, what is, you know, what are the capital needs? What are the capital needs looking five years, 10 years down the road? Um, could the same kind of service be offered by the private sector at Cherry Hill um, and still have recreational golf offered as an opportunity for North Amherst with all the other amenities, i.e. hiking, walking, uh, bird watching, running, um, and Winterfest and things like that. So I think Ray and I have to kind of double down our efforts to pull this working group together with Paul and really look at you know, what does the next five to 10 years look like at Cherry Hill? So, you know, I'm committed to doing that with Ray. And I think it'll be very instructive to kind of get a full picture and come out with some sort of report at the end of that with a recommendation through the town manager, say, to the council or as part of, you know, a future budget year. So that's kind of, um, and, and of course, we would be working with the finance team with Melissa and Holly on that as well. Um, but that's kind of what my interest is in in looking at that long term. My worry is that what happens when staff turns over, what happens when we get retirements, what happens, can we hire people um, and expect the same kind of commitment that we have there and now with a very small staff? So sustainability of that operation is kind of fundamental to me or for me. So that's what I'll be looking at. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, I'm um, fond of quoting Mark Twain when it comes to golf. And uh, I, I he, he said it was a good walk spoiled. Right. Uh, and I, I know that we have the ghost of, of Larry Kelly who still haunts the uh, haunts Cherry Hill and, and needs to be exercised. And Ray, I want to congratulate you for all the efforts you've been making. I mean, golf is a tough business to be in. And David, I think your question about could a a private sector offer a golf program. I think Hickory, Hickory Ridge answers that. Uh, we own it. Um, it, it. It's it's tough. And I, I really want to uh, commend, Ray, we want to commend you uh, and Dave Zomek as well for the, the, the kind of attitudes this is displayed here because providing a valuable service to the town, making it available to all comers who live in the town, makes the town more attractive, it makes the town more valuable, and it builds a commitment to the community. So um, all power to you in making Cherry Hill work. If it doesn't work, I trust that you and your team will come up with some pretty good alternatives that continue to meet the needs of, of, uh, of those of us who live in town. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Melissa. I just wanted to say um, in terms of the um, budgeted revenue, um, I, 
I know that my history in the past, and I, I hope Holly can confirm this on me, is that we tend to be fairly conservative on um, revenue um, budgets, especially in departments. It's like a golf course um, where a lot of the revenue is seasonal dependent, like what's the weather like this golf season? And so you really, we always make a low estimate and you know we always hope, and I'm sure Ray is working very hard diligently to surpass that number, but we always try to make a conservative estimate um, just to be safe um, as to what we, we really think we can get in the worst weather conditions um, in a golf course, um, because golf course is so weather dependent. Thank you. Holly? Well, that was exactly part of what I was going to say. <clears throat> um, it is exactly that. You know, we have not raised our revenue um, estimates very much simply because it is very, very, very dependent upon the weather. And weather in New England, as everybody knows, is certainly changing. And we don't know if it's going to continue or if we're going to have, you know, major floods again. And folks will not be able to golf. And a couple other things I just wanted to sort of clarify, um, uh, some sort of questions were asked about the fringe benefits and the capital. And so with the fringe, um, again, we don't necessarily allocate out folks fringe benefits to their departments. So I used basically just a 10 year average of what the towns, you know, per every dollar of salary, it's X percent of fringes. Um, most of the folks there are part-timers. So those fringe benefits could be slightly lower than what that estimate is. Um, but again, the vast majority of fringe benefits is based on folks' health insurance um, choices. And you know, one more person adding a family health plan, health insurance to, um, you know, to our expenses could could change drastically. Um, and with the capital items, they, um, Andy was exactly right. Some of those um, capital items, especially in the earlier years where you see smaller amounts, um, there was a point in time where we were actually leasing to own some of that equipment. So equipment would be broken out over a three-year period, you know, say instead of going out and spending $30,000 for a mower in one year, we would spend $10,000 in one year, $10,000 in the next year, and $10,000 in the following year to try to level some of those out. Um, back in the, um, you know, probably about 10 years ago, we utilized more uh, lease payments because it was easier and cheaper for us. Um, and... Um, so that that is exactly why some of that capital is broken out the way it is with some smaller figures in some years. It may have been one piece of equipment that we financed over a three year period. So just wanted to clarify those couple of things. Yeah, and and Holly, I just so uh, I I certainly understand that we that normally fringe is not attached to each department budget. I I, mm -hmm. I understand that, and I was just trying to. It's just very helpful to see it. Yeah, to get so they sense of what the the total cost is, but I I, I understand that. And yeah. Ray, you mentioned something that really struck a chord with me, and that is the demographics of the people that are golfing at Cherry Hill. I think if we could get some more information on that, I know you don't have it offhand, but you know, it may it may only be anecdotal. I don't know, but if we're really serving a broad demographic range within the community. I think that's something that's important to know. Um, and uh, I, I think if uh, Dave, if, if you know, you look deeper dive into into the golf course, if you could try to gather some of that information, I think that would be very helpful for people to know uh, that, you know, if, if we're not just serving one narrow uh, slice of the, the community, we're serving a broader spectrum of people. Um, any other comments or questions? No, actually, it's been very, it's been very helpful. Thank you, Ray and David and Melissa and uh, Holly for your comments. Um, are there, Thank you. That's all that we have up for our agenda. There was one item I wanted to bring up, and that is I will not be able to attend our next meeting, which is scheduled for the 17th. Um, I'm coming back from vacation on that day, and I might be in town at 2 o'clock, but probably not. Um, uh, my 
flight gets in around noontime. Um, so it's unlikely I'll, I'll be there. Um, so uh, one, one question is, can we move it to the following week? Would that work for everybody on the committee? Um, and you can you can shoot me an email if 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 you if you feel it, it's not feasible. Otherwise, we'll just postpone it a week. Um, I don't really have any agenda items for that week anyway. So maybe we can we can just cancel it uh, if we don't have if there's nothing that's been referred to the committee. Um, I mean I know there's some things we could do some more work on. Uh, particularly the reparations. I know, Kathy, you've been working on that a little bit. I've been playing with spreadsheets with that too. But it's kind of premature to, to, to work more on that unless we just want to do it, you know, to, to sort of get a, a sense of, of what, of what uh, our options are, what, you know, what options would look like. Um, um, but um, anyway, uh, I don't think we need to discuss this, but um, if there's if there's any objections, you know, I, unless there's some some serious objections, I'd like to postpone at least postpone the meeting a week, and maybe uh, I'll I'll wind up canceling. Okay. Um, I will also write up um, what we discussed today and uh, send it around before I I disappear. I'm gonna uh, I start my vacation on on saturday so i'll send it around to people beforehand uh so um <coughs> uh, you can uh you can review it and maybe i can get it to uh to lynn uh in time to have it presented at next next council meeting um any other questions or comments Let's see. okay um Sorry, I hit the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, okay, I will uh, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I vote aye. Uh, Andy? Aye. Kathy? Yes. Councilor Haneke? Aye. Uh, Tom? What we normally do is we, we ask uh, the non-voting members, if they support or they're uh, uh, they fail to support, a motion. Right, that was that was my uh, <laughs> worry. I'm uh, I'm I'm indicating support without voting. <laughs> Bernie, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks. It was a very helpful meeting. Bye bye. Thank you.